Geospatial intelligence has become a vital and necessary asset for decision makers across almost all industries and market sectors. There are plenty of discussions happening on the technology and innovation happening in the GEOINT space, but there's been very little focus on GEOINT as a market, as an industry. That is what we're going to talk about today. My guests today share their over four decades of GEOINT experience to industry newcomers to access capabilities and discover opportunities within the GEOINT market. Although many people use GEOINT every day, very few people actually understand it in a way that is useful in its application. That means innovative ideas for software, space-based satellite systems, or even nonprofit organizations often fall flat when attempting to access niche markets such as geospatial intelligence. The uniqueness of geospatial data and the niche nature of geospatial science provide barriers to accessing the $127 billion in GEOINT market value. In short, you need a Sherpa, someone to guide you on your path to accessing the market, someone who understands the impact of your innovation or idea with the network, know-how, and insight to guide it in reaching its full potential. That is why today I'm talking with the founders of GEO261, Brian Monheiser and Anthony Calamito. They are a one-of-a-kind GeoInt consultant who agreed to share some of their insider knowledge with us today, and maybe one of the only times they'll actually do it for free. My name is Nick. This is The NDS Show. Hit the subscribe button while you're there and enjoy Brian and Anthony from Geo261. Anthony, Brian, thanks for joining me. Let's start out with, what is GEO261? Wow, GEO261, the brainchild of Anthony Calamito and Brian Monheiser over a seven-year career working at Esri and flying all around the world together and getting to sit in a number of different environments and realize that there was a lot of stuff that we had seen and we had done and that we knew and people that we had known uh, and, and still know today, uh, and we thought we could take our talent and our knowledge and our you know, past experiences and kind of bring those together and help out uh, other folks that are doing work uh, in the geospatial realm uh, and more specifically inside of the government space and, it, and a little bit of a- academia and industry too, but it was you know primarily focused on government activities. Well, I think anybody in the geospatial intelligence industry in the United States, I'll say, it's a growing market outside the United States. Uh, they know who you guys are. So uh, it's great to have you here. Um, what? But what is 261? Where'd that come from? What's that all about? <laughs> that, that's what happens when you search the internet for hours on end, realizing that everybody has stolen all the good domains that are out <laughs> there and, and yeah. tucked them away. And I eventually gave up. And, uh, you know, I, I got into the geospatial world via the Marine Corps. And if you're a, a geointer, your, your your MOS is 0261, uh, you know, geospatial intelligence. So I just kind of combined the two. And when I typed in geo261, it was available. And I was looking for a, an easy way to to end the search for that right domain. So that's where it comes from. The, the real answer and, is geohefe was already taken. That's the real answer. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, I, I'm not shocked that you stopped at Geo 261 because, I mean, being a Marine, it was probably very difficult to spell geospatial. So, it, it, pretty- yeah, it was. It was. And I, was, I wasn't I was going to get out of dictionary. <laughs> short, short and sweet is usually the best. Well, very good. Um, obviously, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in the geospatial intelligence space. Um, it's predicted, I read recently, that market cap of $120 billion in geospatial intelligence by 2027. Um, You guys are experts in the geospatial intelligence industry. If I'm interested in GeoInt, right, but I don't know anything about GeoInt at all, how do I access that market? Like, where do I, where do I begin to even look? So it's actually a really good question. It's a question a lot of folks come to us with, right? How do I break into the United States market? How do I understand where I play or what I can do to get, to get involved? I think the answer is a little more complex than, than simple, unfortunately. But, um, 
I think the easiest way to start is to get involved with a lot of the events, the public facing mm -hmm. events, conferences, trade shows, hackathons. There's a lot of opportunity to kind of get involved and see what's there, build a network, understand if your technology or service or capability fits uh, an existing need or requirement within the geospatial intelligence market. And then, you know, working with folks like, like Brian and I and, and others who, you know, have spent 20 plus years in this space, building those networks and making those connections, we're the kind of people that would love to work with you. Right. And, you know, we, over the last, I'd say probably two or three years, Brian and I have seen a ton of interest from outside of the U S so in Europe in particular, a lot of good, interesting technology on the satellite side, uh, you know, on the EO and small sat side, on the SAR side, that's, that's in some cases better than what we have here in the States and wanting to get involved and trying to understand, you know, are there forms you have to fill out? Is there check boxes you have to check? Right. Of course the answer is yes. And, and our job is to really help those organizations work through that process, guide them, uh, like a shaman or a shepherd, right? How do, how do you get from point A to point B, making sure you take all the right turns. And so I, there's a ton of ways to get involved. I think the very first thing you need to do is get into it, see it. I think the trade shows, events, conferences, hackathons, I think those are a great place to start. And you'll very quickly understand, do I have a thing that meets a need, a known need? And then if yes, getting involved with the right folks to, to get you connected with the right network and get you involved from the start, I think is the right way to do it. it yeah, I'd, like I'd a, add, yep. I was going to yeah. say, I would add that there's, there's probably another piece to that too, which is how do you even get into it, right? How do you even find out that it's a thing? It's not like going to the to the auto show or to the boat and RV right. show, right? You just don't come kind of come across it and go to it and go, oh, this is interesting. And so it goes back to that piece of you know, how do you learn about it? And I, you know, I was fortunate enough to to get into it via the Marine Corps and get, you know, probably the best training that you can possibly get, right? Our DOD puts us through 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 some amazing you know, courses of study and we get some of the best training on the planet. But how would you learn about this any other way? And I've also had the opportunity to watch over my career. You know, we went from, I'm going to start to date myself, a little embarrassing, but you went from having a flip phone that didn't do anything to having a phone that all of a sudden started having maps and apps and all these other things. And you can attribute, you know, Esri to significant growth of people becoming consumers and then Google Earth and all these other things and, you know, MapQuest. And it just became a, a very, consumable thing for everybody, but I still don't think the masses really understand what did people have to do and what did people learn and what were the technologies they used and what were the, you know, the methodologies in play in order to make that a consumable, you know, item because early in the Marine Corps, a product was a, was a finished hard copy product, right? It was a, a, a story, right? Or, or a, a response to a question that you gave somebody in a, in a PowerPoint slide or in a printed product or in a, uh, you know, some sort of custom map graphic, but now everything's digital, right? So everybody mm -hmm. can be a consumer and that didn't used to be the case. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned you were originally trained in the Marine Corps, you know, like what is, what does that training involve? Like what are the different aspects of the Marine Corps training that you think kind of sets you up to, to learn this geospatial intelligence stuff? Well, we were roughly in school about nine months. And I think the thing that made it interesting was we started off doing geodetic survey. I mean, that's not the thing that people think of when they think of GIS or they think of, you know, geospatial intelligence. They don't think about the geodetic survey, land survey. And we were forced to, to go out and hump around with a bunch of gear and, and understand, you know, what, what, what and how this this planet worked, um, and and when we got done with the geodetic survey side of things, you, we moved up upstairs to computers, and those computers had a bunch of books stacked in front of them, and it was datums and ellipsoids and projections and data layers, and it was the whole science behind everything, and you know magically the computer was sitting behind it, and that computer was going to have some software on it that made it easier to do your job or it took everything that you pulled out of those books and. And somebody had had made it something you could do better and faster, but you had to understand the science and the methodologies that went into it before you could even really get to the computer and do anything with it. So I feel like we were very fortunate that you know we were kind of 
forced through all those parts and pieces. And we didn't just start pushing keys on a, on a keyboard and hoping for some sort of, you know, mysterious output. What I think is actually pretty, pretty cool and interesting is I was a, I was an army guy, right? And uh, still am, I guess, technically you could say, once you serve, you're always associated with that branch. Um, geospatial intelligence wasn't really a thing, right? It wasn't really a thing when, when I was in, um, I left active duty in 2006 and, uh, we, we've just seen it grow and expand like a, like an octopus tentacles going into all these different things. And everyone's saying, Oh, that's geospatial intelligence. Uh, primarily in the early two thousands, I always thought of it as just this military application, right? This, we're talking intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, assets overhead, geolocation, you know, warheads on foreheads type thing. And now it's agriculture. Now it's um, finance. It, it's it's pushed into so many different markets. A lot of that has to do with the explosion of this commercial satellite um, industry. A lot of that pushed by Elon Musk, obviously, with his his SpaceX uh, capability to, which has reduced the cost of, of uh, launching a satellite. Um, but maybe you could tell me about your experiences and just kind of witnessing this, this crazy growth of this geospatial intelligence market to where it is to th- today. And even maybe crazier is where it's, where it's going to be in 10 years. I think it's just going to keep getting more, more and more uh, insane. Nick, there's a um, there's a project that Penn State University did in conjunction with PBS Broadcasting called the uh, the Geospatial Revolution. It was produced in the early 2000s, but it, the videos are still there today. And I think the message from it was geography is ordinary, and it's becoming more and more ordinary every day. And and what that means really is geography has always been around. Geospatial as a concept has always been a thing. It's just become more and more a part of our everyday lives. I mean, think about the phone in your pocket, right? You have a map of the entire world in your pocket. And furthermore, if you want to get between any two places on earth, it's very simple for an app just to simply tell you how to get from here to Starbucks. And the nice little lady in the phone tells you to turn left and turn right and stop at the stop sign and all that kind of good stuff. But behind the scenes, most people don't realize that there's a least cost path algorithm that uses your starting point and your ending point and if you've never heard of Dijkstra's algorithm, you'll have no idea, you know, what what least cost path analysis is actually doing behind the scenes. But but the fact that you don't have to know is what's amazing, is because geography has become ordinary and it's become an everyday part of our lives. Everything happens in a place. Most people go between places on the earth, and most things are affected by where on earth they are, whether it's weather and climate. Uh, whether it's the, you know evapotranspiration and the amount of moisture a, a certain area of Earth gets, everything's affected by where, and it's why you see companies like Esri who have made it their motto: the science of where. Right, this idea that location really is everything. And so, I think to your question, we're seeing the uses of geography become more and more ordinary in agricultural uh, use cases, in manufacturing and mining, and certainly on the military side. I don't know why that happened. I feel like because of the, that was weird. One of those weird technology glitches. I feel like because, because of the, um, uh, the money, right. That comes into the the military, you were able to see the results of geospatial quicker because of all the things you mentioned, right. Satellites and ships, we can put space and persistent Mm -hmm. surveillance. But as those things become more ordinary and become cheaper to acquire and use, we now see high precision GPS on agricultural equipment and on construction equipment. We see obviously all the technology that's built into our phones and our websites. So I think we'll continue to see that uh, more and more. As technology becomes cheaper to acquire and use, stuff that's typically been reserved in a military context will become just a part of our everyday lives. Yeah, I think um, I saw the other day, it was uh, a news article about John Deere uh, purchasing a bunch of space assets, right? This is kind of this along the lines of the same thing, which is you're just seeing geospatial intelligence uh, kind of pushing into these new markets. I think agriculture is obviously a massive opportunity for, you know, they call it precision, precision agriculture. I think John Deere is doing it to 
provide more value to their farmers and whatnot. Um, but why why would someone need to let's say hire a consultant to enter the geospatial intelligence market? Like, what's what's unique about it? Like, you know, could I just go to some of these events and trade shows? Like, the Geoint Symposium is coming up here in St. Louis, Missouri. We can talk about that a little bit. Um, but why why would I need a consultant for this? Like, what's what's so special about it? I'll take a I'll take a first stab at that. It's you okay. know it's it's funny, Nick. When we went to school at Fort Belvoir, right? Again, I we were there nine-ish months there'll be some other tote bites who will tell me it was eight or 11 or 52 or whatever the number was but it was definitely almost a year when we were graduating i remember one of our instructors telling me and again this is nine months of school this is every day it's eight hours a day and i remember him saying you need to hurry up and get to the fleet and you need to get on a machine because right now you are a jv level practitioner and I can remember thinking to myself, I'm like, after all this school and all these hours and they're running you through tests, you know, every other week and dropping certain people who who can't cut it. And I thought to myself, I'm like, I just went to school for nine months and you're telling me that I'm a I'm a freshman basketball player. And like I don't even get to sit on the JV bench and put on or the varsity bench and put on the jersey. And that was really eye opening to me uh, about how complex the the science was how complex the tradecraft was and how complex the technology was and, 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 and is becoming. I also remember thinking to myself, you know, what is there, 180,000 people in the Marine Corps? And there were only 160 or 180, you know, uh, uh, geospatial um, uh, bodies in the Marine Corps. And I thought to myself, that's 1%, right? We were the ones that were mm-hmm. shipped around everywhere and connected to every group. Everybody that had to have some sort of, you know, spatial temporal component to what they did needed to borrow one of us, right? They needed to learn from us. And so I think the, you know, that that's not gone away. And to Anthony's point earlier, I think there's less, there's less of those types of people now. There's less of those people going through schools. I mean, there's geospatial uh, degrees at, you know, what is it, 200 accredited universities. But if you think about the number of people that use it versus the number of people that go and get, get, formally trained on it, those numbers are still drastically lopsided. So if you want some folks that really understand the industry, that really understand mm-hmm. how it how it uh, is involved in every vertical, you know, I think what's cyber and geospatial are probably about the only two things that, that cross cut every single industry you can think of. You've got to have some folks that have you know, kind of been there and done that and really understand it. And then can kind of think of how it works, you know, from industry to industry. So I think that's the real reason you need you need you know a consultant of some sort, somebody that's got chops it, just like anything else, right? You don't you don't have a, a plumber with no years experience come run all the plumbing in your house. You just don't do that. So I think that's you know, that's the real reason. Yeah. I, I think you know, just to add to that, I think obviously years of experience, right, uh, can mean a lot of things. I think for the geospatial industry it means a network, a connections, right? Folks that mm-hmm. that know what they're doing and how to get into certain areas and how they can make introductions for you, right? That's certainly one aspect of it. But I think the other aspect is one of the things Brian and I sort of specialize in, to be quite frank, is product market fit. They're, you know, very important words for folks that build software, build solutions, build applications. How do you know that the thing you offer is a fit for the market you're going after? How do you quantify that, right? How do you, how do you tell somebody definitively that, yes, this thing is a fit? for this particular market. Now there are ways to do it, right? There's lean product methodology, there's product led growth, there's these different, um, I'll call them methodologies, right? That are used to measure and assess whether or not the thing you have meets a market. And what Brian and I do is number one, we, we, we do horizon scan. We, you know, we're aware of what's in the market and we can tell you how crowded the market is for the type of solution you have. But I think more importantly, we're also now apt and, and able to help organizations measure that fit, right? How well is it that you fit for the market you're going after? Maybe maybe you just need to tweak something, right? Maybe the marketing and messaging is just slightly off. Or maybe the reality is the, the personas that you've typically been going after are the wrong personas, right? Maybe there's a different type of buyer or user, maybe in a completely different industry that would be better suited to your product than the one you're typically trying to shoot for. So I think 
that's where the expertise comes in, right? Is this understanding of we've sort of been there, we've done that, we have a, a vast network that we can pull upon to then assess whether or not what you're doing meets a need. And if it doesn't, how to change it or tweak it or modify it uh, so that it does. In, in your opinions, uh, you know, what would be kind of, what are those major trends or major needs in the market right now in the geospatial intelligence market? Like, where are you seeing a lot of people reaching out to you for help and, um, or even on the flip side, just your, your friends and, and network saying, Hey, we could use more X, Y, Z. Like what, what is that? What are those gaps that, um, need to be filled? Yeah, that's a tough one. Brian, I can start with a few things if you want. Uh, sure, go for it. I, I think Brian alluded to this a few minutes ago. I think what we're seeing is a renaissance of geospatial experts uh, is needed. So right now there's a ton of people who are geo-enabled, right? They're familiar with the space. They know how to use the software. They, they press a button and something comes out the other side. But I think the reality is there's a need right now for experts who understand, is the answer that I got the right answer? And so I think a lot of what we're seeing right now is requests for folks who understand geospatial science, who can validate and verify whether or not what's occurring is correct or right. I think we're seeing that more and more as we start to lean into AI and machine learning to automate some of the things that we as analysts typically did, you know, in, in the younger parts or earlier parts of our careers, because we knew how to validate whether or not answers were correct. So as we start to move into a more automated, you know, uh, time frame or infrastructure, there's an increase in folks who need to understand, is that answer right? So I think that's, that's one big thing. I think the other big thing is, you know, as more and more technologies that are remotely sensed become popular, it started with photography and, you know, electrical optical sensors. It's moved on to SAR. We've got RF now. There's all sorts of things that are being hyperspectral, right? I could go on and on and on. I think there's now a bunch of questions over, what is the most effective and for what reason? You know, active sensors like LIDAR and radar are great for uh, obscured cloud cover, dust, nighttime collect, right? Whereas EO is great for, for visual light and areas that are not obscured. But what about in areas that are denied? Or what about in areas where those technical sensors don't work for one reason or another? How do you start to collect? So I think, again, it boils down to there's a tremendous amount of expertise that comes from the folks who know the science. And I think they're being increasingly called upon to help sort of sift through uh, all the technologies that are out there and highlight what works best in what scenario. So yeah, you know, like I, I, sorry. You're, you're okay, Brian. I was going to say, it sounds like the biggest gap is humans. I mean, humans. <laughs> yeah. Hum, humans but the human knowledge. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, well, you're, 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 well, you're covering down on the piece, right? That everybody wants the answer to their question fast. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to do that, right, is you either have to have more humans. For the Anthony's point, there's got to be some sort of AI ML that rips through that data and starts to provide you answers. But I think the thing that people want the most is there's so much data now and so much access to data, and there's so few data scientists, and there's so few people that, that can understand and validate that what you have is in fact correct and the processes you put in place to interrogate the data and to provide you some sort of derivative are correct. But everybody just wants the the piles and piles and piles of data. They want that to go happen off in the corner somewhere and they just have on your machine pop up, hey, you should pay attention to this or you should pay attention to this or go work on this. I think that's the big thing, right? Everybody just wants it you know, faster. Um, at the same time, wanting it faster and then when companies are coming and going, hey, we can we can kill it for you. We do a lot faster. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's that mean for my job security? And then you're like, and then you're back in another problem was, what well, do you want it faster? Or do you want to make sure that you've got enough work, or so much work to do that you could never, never be replaced? It's sort of an interesting thing too, Nick. Brian just brought up this idea that, you know, AI ML and automation is going to kill off jobs. There's a real fear right now. I mean, there's a lot of companies, particularly in the defense industry, who make a lot of money on putting butts in seats for lack of a better term. And I hate, I hate to generalize it, but that's really what it is for a variety of services based work and AI and automation is seen largely as a threat to that, right? If I can't get paid for my body in a seat, what's the value of my contract? It's going to go down. So I think there's a really interesting 
to your point earlier, why do people come to us? I think they're trying to look for ways to validate and assure their employer, which sometimes is the government, that the automated responses they're getting from software and services is as correct as what they would get from a body. Because if it isn't, not only are there bigger questions about automation and AI, but there are questions around should contracts be let that don't have a requirement for a human to validate things, a human in the loop, right? Yeah, let me let me just defend some humans real quick here. As <laughs> an owner of a company that supplies plenty of butts and seats, I would never refer to it this way. Um, it, it's unfortunate that uh, that seems to be a terminology that's used. It makes sense. I get why why it's a terminology that's used. Uh, people are very dynamic. Okay, the artificial intelligence is a long way from being as dynamic as a human. That being said. There's plenty of tasks that humans are doing that could be completely automated um, at this point. I mean, geez, with all these language models and and stuff like that, it's it's, it's pretty crazy to think about. But I, I've always, as a person that's owned a couple companies and things like that, I'm always amazed by people. You know, I might hire someone to do like a human resources job, but they'll go and do some marketing stuff, right? Um, they'll help out with... Uh, you know, a trade show or they'll do, you know, help out in ways that you wouldn't expect. And uh, I think there's, there is value in, in being dynamic and, it, and it's all often goes undervalued in the, um, in the marketplace, which is, you know, if I hire someone to be a geospatial intelligence analyst working, say at the NGA place, NGA headquarters in St. Louis, well, they're also going to be a person in that community. They're going to be a node in that community. That's a resource. Uh, they're also going to be a dynamic asset to multiple other things going on aside from that that one task that they were assigned to do during uh, for that mission. So I think it's a great argument to have about butts and seas versus AI. The real future, as I think you both would probably agree with me, is uh, it's a human that knows how to use AI to the to the T that just is just so versed in the different tools, the different programs, the different prompts, um, that sort of thing. Um, I think that's, that's where everything's going. I don't think it's, I don't see AI replacing a lot of these types of jobs. I think they're, I think they're far too technical and, and I think it requires far too much, uh, human cont contextual based thinking, um, in, in order for it to have a huge impact. Who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe in 10 years, right. we'll have another one, one of these podcasts and we'll just be uh, a bunch of suckers. <laughs> we, we won't actually I, I, be on the podcast. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it'll just be, yes. it'll be three the AI uses talking about this stuff. Yeah. I think, I think the one thing that's, that's important too, and I've, I've worked for a couple companies and, and Anthony and I represent a couple companies now where I think the really cool answer is, is when you can tell somebody that the AI will remove the noise, right? Like instead of, mm -hmm going yeah. through the, the haystack looking for needles. Can I remove all the hay and just leave you with a pile of needles? There's still expertise that that person has to employ when they're going through those needles. They're going to have domain expertise. They're going to have regional expertise. They're going to have you know, cultural expertise on certain topics that I don't think you can ever replace with, with AI. But if those things could remove a lot of the noise for those people, allowing them to just focus on the stuff that they need to do, I think that's the win, right? That's the real win. And so you're always, you're going to need AI, but you're, to your point, Dick, you're going to have to have those people that have, you know, the chops, the bona fides, right? The, the past performance to say, oh, I've done this, or I know what this is, or I've seen this before. Or to your point too, having that network of people to go ask questions of or to engage in, in, in thought provoking dialogue on a specific topic. And you're not going to get that from AI. Yeah. And, and just to be clear for everybody listening, I am not advocating that AI replace humans. I was saying quite the opposite. Uh, that That's a question we get asked. And I think what we've done as practitioners of geography have helped people understand that you, you can't replace a human. Now, you may assist a human through AI and automation, but I don't think you can replace them. So I to total agreement there. It does bring up an interesting point, which is, uh, and Nick, you mentioned this, right? The G1 Symposium is right around the corner. Uh, it starts early next week, this weekend, actually. Um, it's really interesting for us. And I just got back from Tampa. I was down at uh, Soft Week, uh, another big conference for us geo people. Um, 
really interesting to see the messaging and the dynamics change year to year. I think, you know, AI and ML and computer vision certainly had a big role the last last year. I think we'll still see that this year. But I'm actually curious as I go to these conferences to see what changes, right? What's the new top du jour? Uh, what's the new buzzword we're going to hear this year? I think open source was last year's big geoint topic. Um, you know, AI was definitely one of those as well. But I'm curious to see if that if that changes here next week. Well, I think their their tagline is <clears throat> from maps to metaverse. And so there you go. I don't I don't know. I, I think Meta, the company Meta, didn't they just scrap their entire <laughs> metaverse endeavor? They've spent billions of dollars and they're like, mm, this ain't it. This this uh, may not be the big thing. <laughs> this this might not be the thing that gets Zuckerberg his next trillion dollars. Um it's definitely definitely a crazy thing to consider. So uh you you mentioned the June symposium in St. Louis again next week. Um St. Louis. <sighs> you're gr- you're growing on me. I love the beer. All right. I love I love the Cardinals. I love some good baseball. Um and the barbecue. Uh, and I think Don't forget the barbecue. I haven't had the St. Louis barbecue. You know, I'm in I'm in North Carolina. We have some pretty darn good bar- barbecue here. Um <laughs> They say around here, all we have is pigs and pig skin. So that's just to give you an idea uh, of the sort of barbecue action we have here. Um, but maybe you could talk about just this kind of, I know NGA has been, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, has been in St. Louis for quite a while. But it seems with this this new um, headquarters going in there, maybe, maybe Brian, maybe you could talk about um, what, what this is re-emergence of geoint as a market in st louis has been like like what like what's going on there like are all the are all the birds buzzing yeah i i i took a a stab at my first ever blog a couple weeks back and you know inter inter comments about marines and being able to write or write without crayons or eating the crayons or whatever you want to put in there but um you know i was kind of compelled to write that because when i came here in 2002 straight out of the Marine Corps. First job was at NGA. And I could literally go talk to people. You, know, you go to go to a bar and try to talk to a nice young lady. She's like, oh, what are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm a geospatial intelligence analyst. she go, huh? And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. she go, huh? And you're just like, all right, I give up. Um, and, and what people knew it as was the place across from the brewery, right? The mapping place across from the brewery, right? And it, it had obviously gone through you know, all of its evolutions, you know, you know most recently you go, going from you know, DMA to, to NGA, right? But then um, it, it, in, in my mind, it really was a couple of events that started to, to kind of blow it up in St. Louis. It was, yep, Robert Cardillo uh, and the powers that be committed to uh, a new facility and keeping that thing in in downtown St. Louis, I think it was, you know, capturing Bin Laden, and uh, you know the there was the I don't remember which order they were, but there was a you know a CBS there was a 60 Minutes episode that that, that Robert Cardillo did where he talked about you know you know commercial satellite imagery uh, specifically mm-hmm. uh, focused on Planet Labs, uh, and then there was the the CBS um, this morning uh, aired the the tour that um, that that Bob Sharp had given where they talked about, you know, the model builders and building out that model uh, of, of Bin Laden's compound. Right. And I think folks started to go, Oh, that's the, that's what they do at that mapping place. So that's why that mapping place is important. And of course you throw a new building in that's worth $1.75 billion. Anybody looks mm-hmm. at that number and goes, Oh, well, there must be some multiple. If you're going to, if you can spend that kind of money, you know, on a building, what are the opportunities that surround that building or, or uh, that surround, you know, adjacent markets. And I think that really created uh, a buzz around St. Louis. And if you'll see, or, you, you know, you, people will see this next week, there's you know, greater St. Louis Inc, which is a you know, economic development group within St. Louis. Um, you know, they've started you know, geo futures and they have built out an entire geo futures roadmap and, you know the things that need to happen here and grow here. It's it's really not just here. It's it's the opportunities across the entire geospatial landscape. You know some folks are paying a, probably more attention than anywhere else to that because of the the new NGA facility. So 
you know, you mentioned there being $120 billion of a, of a geoint market by, by 2027. That, that's got to that's gotta happen somewhere. And you certainly aren't going to hit um, that target with just the St. Louis region alone. So I think that's where there's, there's a lot of buzz. And, you know, we've been fortunate that we have, we've had past leaders, right? Robert Cardillo's, the Bob Sharks, um, that have that have invested time and energy into the St. Louis community. Um, you have different, um, you know, public or private investment coming into the area as well. Mm-hmm. Um, St. Louis has been pretty successful in the biotech space and then the ag tech space over the last twenty years, um, and so they see an opportunity to for for economic development around around geospatial. And as we've been talking about on you know, on this episode, it's it's everywhere, right? It's over at the Danforth Plant Science Center, and it's at you know Bayer Monsanto, and it's you know over at, at Ameren, which is our you know our energy company here in town. It's everywhere, right? It's, I mean, geospatial is at Budweiser when you start talking transportation logistics. So I think that 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 new building really kind of opened up people's eyes to an industry that not a lot of people mm-hmm. know about, and now they're starting to kind of pay attention to to other places where that's relevant. I think I saw a number uh, in one of the, the, the geo futures documents that said there was 53,000 geospatial related jobs in the region. Well, we know that there's only so many of those you can put in the DOD and IC space. So that means there's an awful lot of people who are either deep in geo or they kind of skirt that, that line of, of being a hardcore geo person that, that are around. So, um, you know, folks are taking taking notice and realizing that it's a growing industry. And I think, you know, you've even noticed, Nick, you go search on the internet a little bit, you'll find, you know, a couple of different numbers, but the mm-hmm. potential uh, market for this is extreme. So why not jump on that? Um, and, I, and I believe St. Louis University is also pretty much behind this full steam, right? I mean, you mentioned all those job openings. They got to be uh, trying to educate people and get them, get them up to speed for that. Um, I wanted, yeah, I the, to ask. Saint, well, I was going to say too. We want to make sure not to cut out the fact that you know, St. Louis University has had you know longstanding relationships in this space for well over ten years. But you've also got University of Missouri St. Louis that's created uh, uh, partnerships with NGA. Uh, you've also got University of or, um, Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, which actually pumps mm-hmm. out a lot of of geospatial folks. So there's a number of universities in the region, even include uh, University of Illinois. Uh, uh, which is just a few hours away. So there's a number of universities that can that can pump some talent into the region. Uh, I have an important question I want to ask both of you because I think this is something we don't talk about enough in geospatial intelligence. It's the dang money, all right? Not just how can I as an analyst earn more money or do some money, but how does the money flow? Where does it go? Where does it start? Where does it end? Like, is it is it all coming from the government? Is it all coming from private industry? Um, where where is the money at? Right. If if you are trying to enter this market and like, hmm, I, I have some ideas. Uh, where do I? Where should where should someone be looking if they're looking to maybe invest in something? Um, but let's let's talk about money because I feel like it's such a it's such a like we never talk about it. You go to all these I've been to a million geospatial intelligence symposiums. I never once have had seen one session where they say, This is how you get paid more money, geoint professional. Um how in, that's critically important. Money is the incentive which drives a lot of these things, drives innovation, drives professional development. You know, uh let's let's talk about the money. Let's do it. Let's do it here. And this this will be the rubber stamp. The entire Jewett community right now, you need to listen in because we're about to talk about money. The, the Show Me the Money podcast. Is that what this is? Show, is that what this is? show, <laughs> show me the money. <laughs> I feel like we're bellying up to the blackjack. No, what, here. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, isn't it kind of like this? It's almost, like, it's almost like an unwritten rule in this space where we don't talk about money. But it, it's, it's so stupid because as an entrepreneur, as someone that's started multiple businesses, um, it's vitally important. It's important to know about the money. Uh, I'm not saying it's everything, but uh, how you know where? How does it work in the geoint market? It's a loaded question, Nick. It's 
it's not loaded. You, 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 well, 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 and 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 I say that because Your I think it depends on <laughs> it depends on who you are, right? I think there's ways to talk about money as a as an individual, as a professional, right? How you 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 better your career and you make more money for yourself. I think as a small business who wants to break into the market, I think there's discussions around how small businesses have opportunities, right? Whether it's through the Tylo and small business offices, whether it's through set asides that are, you know, con um, mm -hmm. contractually directed towards small business. I think there are opportunities for um, traditionally underserved communities, traditionally underserved businesses and business owners. And then I think there's discussions about how as a new business, you can piggyback opportunities from larger, you know, federal systems integrators and prime contractors to become subs and you know, the opportunities that are there. And then of course there's the whole sibber sitter side of things. So I think I think the answer depends on how who you are and how you ask the question about what point in the story are you. So I don't know I don't well, know what, which of those we want to we attack start, first. <laughs> let's, let, let me attack the probably the most common use case, which is uh I don't know, I'm a twenty two year old and I have a geospatial degree and a and a security clearance. How do I make money? <laughs> it's a good question nowadays. Um, so I think number one, experience. I think uh, there are a lot of folks who pass on the opportunity to do hands-on learning. And uh, I, so I, I was uh, an adjunct at George Mason University for eight years. I still sit on the external board of advisors for NC State University uh, here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we look for the most is folks who've who've done some work, whether that's an unpaid internship, which I know is almost a dirty word nowadays, but whether it's an unpaid internship, whether it's a work internship, a summer work program, I think people who've done it and who have experience tend to, to make more money and tend to garner more opportunities than those that don't, which is unfortunate because you feel like after you come out of college or whatever with a degree or you come out of the military after six years or four years or whatever it is, you go, hey, I'm, I'm ready, right? But the reality is there's probably somebody who's who's put in more effort and more work than you. And so one of the ways I've always encouraged students to increase the odds of landing a job is to get some real world opportunity under your belt. Um, and again, whether that's being an intern for a company, whether paid or unpaid, doing a summer work program or, you know, partnering up with a university who's doing work on behalf of the government. Um, there are always opportunities, I think, where you can make yourself stand out. And I encourage folks to do that. I might have a, a slightly unpopular position on this, but I think there's a couple different pieces, right? We ask, hear. where's the where's the money at? I still think we spend more time trying to convince more people that this is valuable to everything they do, right? You can literally go to a restaurant right now and look at everybody's phone and someone's trying to find their missing AirPods, they're trying to track their kid on like 360. They're trying to see what's the, the nearest flower shop or car wash or or bar near me. Everybody is using something that is driven by geospatial science and technology. Yet none of those people have any clue where that came from or how that happened or why it's important. And I sometimes feel like we spend a lot of time, you know, there's obviously we've convinced people or there wouldn't be budgets for entire intelligence agencies, or there wouldn't be budgets for mm -hmm. for pockets of excellence where this happens. But I still feel like we're convincing the masses that this is a really important and valuable thing. However, nobody nobody knows it or agrees. But if we took away the things that they're accustomed to having, they'd go, "Oh, that's why it stopped working." Um, so I think you know, the 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 market doesn't grow until people get smarter. And those are the people that have access to the purse strings and are making the decisions. And then I'd go completely to the other side, which is a, a bit of a passion project of mine, or mm -hmm. well, at least something I've been I've been more involved with lately. And it's been because of involvement that I've had with the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and in getting to witness their bridge program. Go find me a school that has a geography program. Go find me a school that has real STEM. Now there are STEM programs everywhere, and there are geography programs, but you almost don't find any sort of geography, anything in any school. Uh, and if you can find an AP class, it's, it's AP human geography, right? which is still wildly valuable. But 
but the other piece too that that's missing is how do we start getting to the um I don't know how that happened. How do we start getting to the younger people, right? And introducing them to maps and sensors and satellites and planet Earth and geography and the geosciences. All of that's absolutely missing. And I think until we start to fix some of that, we're not going to have all of the people and all of the jobs and all of the budget and all of the dollars. I think the other one thing too, and we've all got to stop chasing only the federal dollars, right? I think one of the things that I learned at Esri, and I, I you know, I, I didn't, I didn't talk about this, but I learned the Marine Corps is just a guaranteed intel field. When they came up and asked me in boot camp if I'd be interested in geospatial intelligence, I didn't even know what the hell they were saying. I just kind of stood there and looked at the guy like I was an idiot, and it was my senior drill instructor that said he'll take it. So I didn't even pick my own career. It completely happened by accident. But I always felt like we were in some weird secret society of the skulls because there's only a couple of us in the entire Marine Corps that did it, right? Or a small pocket of people. And I still feel that way today. So I don't know. I think until more people understand it uh, or appreciate it, I don't know that, there, that you find more dollars or it makes it easier to get more dollars. So I think we're still teaching the masses why it's important. Well, you, you touched on something there, which I think is a massive opportunity, which is just the commercial space, you know, obviously federal dollars are not going anywhere, right? <laughs> we're, we're, uh, the federal marketplace is going to continue to spend money on, on this for a long time, forever, right? I mean, they have to, there's an entire agency uh, around that. Um, but the commercial market, I mean, the financial markets, you're starting to see companies that are popping up of, hey, we're going to analyze, um, you know, the the amount of coal being uh, produced at this, or the amount of coal being dumped at this plant that's being uh, turned into energy every month. And we're going to sell that information, um, not to mention different uh, places that are looking at like the oil fields and saying how many workers are out of the field, right? How much, how much oil does that correspond to? And, and can I make financial decisions based on that? Um, so, I'm going to, I'm going to give my opinion here, which is, I think that if you are a geoint person, if you're a geospatial intelligence person, you're trained in the military, you're trained outside the military, whatever, hone that skill, get it up. Like, like Anthony's saying, get it up to speed um, and start your own thing because this market is blowing up right now. The commercial application of geospatial intelligence is absolutely um, going through the roof. Uh, I was looking at the agenda of the Geoint Symposium and looking at all the different companies that are that are going to be there. There's all sorts of these new companies that are popping up left and right to take advantage of this sort of thing. And I think it's just an exciting time in Geoint, right? We're seeing we have this the double-headed dragon, right? We have the explosion of satellite uh, commercial satellites, and then you have the explosion of artificial intelligence and new tools and things like that, that are just starting to perpetuate and get more and more crazy. So I think um, if you're in the geospatial intelligence space, you have a skill set and you have, you want to make some money, start your own company. Cause that's ultimately that's, that's where you're going to uh, end up making the most money. Aside from that, team up with somebody that's, that's um, maybe starting a company or the third thing, which I think, is probably one of the most undervalued uh, things that someone can do is start wearing the, the company polo. Whatever company you're at, if you're at one of these big companies, I don't need to name all the companies. There's a million of them, Lidos, BAE, Khaki, whatever. Start wearing that polo to work. And what I mean by that is actually be on the team that you're on, right? And actually push forward for that company, be a representative for that company um, and be the best absolute geoint person you can be for that in, in your role, right? If you're a geoint analyst, right? You look at satellite imagery all day, let's say, be the best one first, do that first, be the technically sound and then actually wave the flag of your company saying, we are the best geoint people. See this, look at me, I'm the best. And, and then start putting, positioning yourself as the subject matter expert in that space 
and you will see opportunity come to you. People will come to you. Oh, I know, I know Tim because he was the best full motion video analyst here, and we need to go to him uh, to do this stuff. Where's he working at? XYZ company. I, I think that's a vi- very um, undersold thing that I think young people, especially, it takes them time to learn that, ah, maybe I should actually promote this this company I'm in because it's it, it ultimately is promoting yourself and, and can lead to financial success. What are your thoughts on, on that uh, take? It's interesting you mentioned the self-promotion thing, right? I, I think mm-hmm. uh, it's taken me a long time to recognize the value of self-promotion. Uh, you know, I was always one of those people that was very modest about, I did my job. I didn't need recognition for it. I, I, I feel like a lot of people do know me. I've been around the community for a while. I feel like I've done a good job throughout my career, but I've never been one to sort of brag about it. And I think to your point, Nick, especially in the age of social media, you almost have to, right? You have to make yourself stand out. Um, you know, a few minutes ago, we talked about product market fit and how you measure those kinds of things. One of the things that we look for is what makes you different and better than your competition, right? I sometimes call this Mm -hmm. the so what, who cares mantra, right? So what, who cares? Well, if you can't answer those questions, if you can't make yourself stand out as a company or as a product of a company, it may be difficult to make yourself stand out against the competition. I think the same holds true in your professional career, right? There's got to be something or some way you can make yourself stand out. And in the age of social media, it's self-promotion, whether you have a blog or a vlog, whether it's you're a podcaster Mm -hmm. like yourself, some way to get your name and what you know out in front of a lot of people. I think it's an easy way to grow your brand and start to promote what you can do, not just for your current company, but potentially for future employers as well. So I, I tend to agree. Yeah, I'd say that, I'd I'd say that audience of people, you know, to, to Anthony's point, any, anybody that's ever done that work finds real satisfaction out of providing accurate and timely answers to problems, right? You don't, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the reason people don't promote themselves because there's an awful lot of joy uh, and satisfaction that you get out of doing that. Um, but maybe that's the, maybe that's the next frontier is how do we start bragging about it a little bit more? And maybe that's the thing that actually starts to get um, the industry a little more recognition and start pushing people towards it is the more we talk about it and the more, we are about it, the more that people will, will see it and want to be part of it. Here, here's a question for you, Nick. You know, there's a lot of, <clears throat> you go on Apple Podcasts, whatever your podcast platform is, and you search for geospatial or mapping, there may be 10 or 12 podcasts, right? But there's not hundreds. You search right. something else, another industry, right? Math or science or construction or whatever. There's probably hundreds, right? If not thousands of different podcasts. So I think the question becomes, is geospatial science still a niche industry in and of its own, or does it just diffuse itself into all the other industries? Meaning how often until there's just a geography department of every company, right? Of every industry, there's a, there's a, there's a geo team for every company vice there being geography companies where the company specializes in geography. I think that's an interesting question that I don't have an answer to. Um, but it does make you wonder as, as geography becomes more ordinary, does it just diffuse itself into everything else? Well, I always say that geospatial is a horizontal market and it can serve any vertical market. And you know, as well as me, that if you do everything, you do nothing. Right. So I think you might, you might be onto something there, which is, you know, the reason that there's not a million geospatial podcasts or YouTube channels or whatever is because there's a million construction things and they also talk about geospatial in fact the uh the the engineering market is actually very interesting uh the way that they approach gis it's just like a thing you know if you go talk to like a builder it's like a what a gis yeah we use that they all do it they all you know they 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 need terrestrial surveys and also i mean all sorts of things building information modeling that all of this has geospatial components to it but the way that they see it it's just like yeah, it's the thing we do over here. Those two guys over there, they do it. Um, and I think that's kind of the way it's, it is in almost any major market segment. Um, but that's, that's okay. You know, it's, it's fine. Uh, when it comes to self-promotion, yeah, everybody should be on these social media apps. They're free. 
Um, if you want to earn more money, then people need to know who you are. Uh, I see, I go on LinkedIn quite often and I'll always see people like promote and stuff. And I'll be like, Hmm, I wish they were doing, I wish this was somebody at my company doing this. Right. I wish, I wish they were doing this for me. Um, so there's definitely something to that. Uh, as a business owner, I definitely want that. And, and I think anybody that hires people, right. You want to have those people in your company. Um, so self-promotion, yes, could help grow the market, at, uh, as a whole, but also lead to financial success for, for people. Um, jumping into the geo symposium, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I do have the agenda up and the map up and stuff like that. Um, we talked a little bit about the current, uh, gaps, in, in, uh, in the market space. Um, there's some interesting, uh, things coming up for discussion there. Um, <clears throat> A lot of talk about generative AI, uh, the metaverse, uh, that sort of thing. Um, is there anything at the symposium that you're looking forward to seeing, learning about, or uh, companies you're interested in uh, seeing what they're doing? For for me, I'm actually really interested to see what the workforce development plan is for St. Louis. Right, there's a ton of opportunity, as we talked about with NGA coming and, and some of the other support organizations and, and industries that'll sort of revolve around that. But what about the workforce development in St. Louis, right? What is the what is the push going to be to get people smart, but then keep them in St. Louis as opposed to having them go somewhere else? And so I'm actually really keen to see some of the initiatives that, um, again, Brian mentioned UMSL, uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis, They've done a lot over the last couple of years to try and build up workforce development in the region and keep it in the region. There are other institutions and organizations like the Taylor Geospatial Institute and others who are trying to develop new methodologies to keep people in St. Louis once they've been trained in St. Louis. And I'm actually really curious to see what, what some of those organizations will be sort of bringing in terms of messaging and capability at the show. I think that's going to be the number one requirement for all of these things to be successful is to have the people to staff it, support mm -hmm. it and run it and, and keep it up and running. I think I'll, I'll add to that piece too, because that is um, really interesting to me. I also want to see what individual companies are doing to engage um, at the lowest levels of education. Right. Like, and I don't mean low in terms of good versus bad. I mean, how early are we starting and engaging with people? So that they know this is a an industry or a career path that they can chase. Um, I think that's gonna have to come from all the different companies that are <laughs> exhibiting at the symposium, right? They've got to adopt schools, they've gotta be engaged, they've gotta promote um the different jobs that, that that go into the geospatial um you know kind of arena. I wanna see some of that. Um and I, I'm always interested to see who's got the next new little widget and then make my uh my provide my opinion on if I actually think it's cool or not. So you have to be careful doing that with people who who built it on their own and really love it because you can offend some people. But I'll be looking to see what what's the next cool thing that somebody thinks they're doing. My favorite's when somebody tells me they've got the best AI ever. And they go, that was really cool right. what you just did. And I go, can you go to the opposite side of the earth now and do that exact same thing? And they go, well, no, I mean, it doesn't work like that. I'm like, well. And you don't have the most amazing AI that you've ever created because it would work everywhere all the time. It's like uh, it's like Sex Panther, right? It works all the time, sixty percent of the time. So I'm waiting to see who's who's got what this time. Sixty percent of the time, it works every time. It works uh, yeah, every time. yeah, yeah. So uh, I was just at that Soft Week uh, symposium as well. I, I ran into Anthony there, um, and one of the things that Global Soft did really well, and hence the name Global Soft um was they brought in a lot of partners from all over the world and i think the geoint symposium usgif if you're listening you need to be doing more of this uh i did notice i went through the agenda and i saw um uh the israeli the israeli military basically is gonna have a booth there israeli israel aerospace industry so it's an israeli company um what what about uh if if i'm a foreign company right and i'm at the joint symposium which supposedly i don't know if this is still the case they used to call this the largest gathering of intelligence professionals in the country i don't know if that's still the case there's some other some other conferences out there but if i'm a foreign company and i want to access 
um, the U.S. intelligence market, which sounds like a little crazy. Um, you know, should should they reach out to Anthony and Brian if I'm the Israeli company startup? <laughs> you know, I think I think the first thing to add to that, right? And you made you made the comment, right? If if USJF is out there listening, um, it's you know Stu Braden and his crew definitely deserve their flowers because what they've done in the way of networking uh, globally and what they've done in networking companies, that's why he's been able to build that. Right? It was his career in uniform. It's been his career out of uniform and the people that he's surrounded himself is the reason that it's ended up like that. Right? So I think the first thing is you can't just ask anybody to do the exact same thing. It's it's going to be important to to create that network of people that can, that can replicate. I think that's the first and most important piece. Um, yeah, I think the we, we've gone to every trade show where there's foreign nationals walking around with a camera and they're videotaping your slides and taking a picture of every slide. And there's a reason why there's CI teams floating around. Um, you know, Anthony's w- way more well versed in this than I am, but the number of companies uh, across the pond in either direction that are starting to build really amazing tech. Um, it's 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 real and the stuff that they're building is really amazing and i think you know from a from an advantage perspective um if we're not partnering with some of these companies or we're including what they're building into our solutions we're probably going to be at a disadvantage so you know you have to you have to at least do those horizon scans both inward and outward um to see what's out there but yeah it's um it's always interesting to see who's in there and, and what they're and, and to, to really understand what their true intent is. Uh, I, I'll add, Nick, I think uh, in the past, some of the foreign companies we've seen at these events are actually looking to get bought, like from an M&A perspective. Mm. Um, and so they present themselves as a small company, just looking to get acquired by a U.S. company so that their technology can sell into the government. Um, but I'd say outside of that, if you are a foreign company looking to legitimately do business as you with the U.S. government, um, you know, they definitely can come seek Brian and I out. We have helped organizations mitigate, mitigate their, their FOCI concerns, a, a, a term for, you know, foreign ownership controlling interest. Um, mm-hmm. There there are ways to to do that. And there is a checklist and a process and things you have to follow. And if you are one of those companies listening who is interested, um, there is a way to do that. And, and we can certainly help. But I, I would just say that I've seen it on both sides. I've seen companies who want to just do business. And then I've seen companies who are there to basically show off to try and get bought so that the whole idea of being a foreign company is sort of mooted. Right. Well, and let's be honest, right? You could probably watch that entire exhibit floor. Almost every one of them has some non-U.S. influence in the company, right? Whether it's who's writing Mm -hmm. the code, whether it's the thing they invented, the company that they bought and they they rolled it up Mm -hmm. into their larger solution, right? I mean... We're not we're not figuring this all out in the U.S. alone. There's a lot of folks out there that are building really amazing things that are that are part of the solutions you use, whether you know it or not. Yeah, uh, a lot of the a lot of the software development is happening overseas. I don't. I think it's just maybe due to the cost of software developers in the United States. We do our own software development here. We just have U.S. developers. They are pricey, but you know it, it is you know that helps mitigate our concerns about. Um, uh, foreign uh, development and things like that. Um, but as far as the global participation in, in the geospatial intelligence space, what's neat is uh, at the end of the day, as an intelligence professional, we want the answers, right? We want the answers. We don't necessarily care about where the data came from. If the data is good, we always want good data. Um, we don't necessarily care where it came from. Uh, there's some great companies that have popped up. I don't know if you're familiar with like Ice Eye. They have some awesome synthetic aperture radar um, imagery. Um, th- there's there's a million of them that are that are popping up left and right. Um, are there any interesting companies in, in your minds that are popping up around the world? Uh, foreign ones in particular, or or foreign and domestic? Any anywhere anywhere really. But I just I think the foreign sp- the 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 space outside the United state seems to be um growing pretty pretty rapidly so i'm I'm just seeing a lot of companies pop up in europe and australia wherever yeah there's there's one company in particular i've been pretty uh impressed by it's a company called satum 
um, and they mm-hmm. do they use SAR, but they do identification and target recognition of objects in SAR. Now, beyond just saying it's a ship, mm. their their machine learning is actually tagged and trained in such a way that it can identify what class of ship. Um, and in some cases, it can get even even more descriptive, right? The exact ship based on unique features of that ship. And so I think when you're talking about, you know, we've come a long way, feature extraction and imagery. I think feature extraction in SAR is 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 sort of at its, it's, it's getting close to its peak, right? There's a lot of good technology mm-hmm. now that can do that. But to be able to identify, not just right. extract an object, but identify what that object is in SAR is pretty interesting and, and somewhat novel. And I think Satum has done a really, really interesting job of that. A great example of a mm-hmm. company that isn't US, but I think is actually industry leading. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, as someone that was classically trained as a synthetic aperture radar imagery analyst, I can tell you it's very difficult to identify what well, used to be anyways. Maybe it's a little bit easier now with the higher point density. Um, but it's very difficult to use SAR to identify the exact models and makes of, of equipment and things like that. And of course, there's always the decoy play. You know, these, these countries will put up, uh, they know what s- synthetic aperture radar is, so they'll put up reflectors that you know have the radio waves bounce off and have it look like an actual you know su-35 or whatever whatever um equipment they're trying to present as the decoy um so anyways cool stuff brian how about you man any any cool companies or i even ideas any good ideas that are floating around the the geoint market recently well the really cool one that that andy and i both got to witness for the first time about a week and a half ago was a company called deja vu ai uh, and they're doing some pretty cool, you know, kind of pattern recognition with, with imagery. And they don't need a whole lot of of an actual image to, to tie it to uh, the larger source. And so they're pretty cool, too. I think they're going to have a booth. So I look forward to seeing that some more, too. We've, we've, we've gotten a little peek into what they can do, but it's, it's pretty awesome. So in terms of ideas, uh, you know, I, this will this will probably rub people the wrong way, too. I sometimes feel like there's not a whole lot of evolution in what we're doing in the geospatial world, right? Um, and so a lot of times I kind of go and I see the same stuff. I see maybe something that's just a little bit better, but it's it's something else. Um, so I don't want to sound like I, I leave unimpressed, but I think sometimes, you know, when you've been doing this this long and you're engaged on the daily, you're not seeing anything really that new or crazy that you hadn't already at least been exposed to on, on, on some level. So it'll be interesting. The, the metaverse thing will be, will be interesting to, to do too. Anthony and I have started to play in a, you know, a, other, other arenas, cyber, OSINT, um, you know, mm-hmm. XR, AR, VR. And there's some, there's some pretty cool stuff going on in those spaces too, um, relative to geo. So it'll be interesting to see who's, who's out there doing cool stuff uh, in, in some of those, those places too. Right. I think that's the thing we talked about. You know, earlier, it's so ordinary that everything is mixed and mashed together and has some sort of geospatial component to it. And so it's it's just seeing how people, you know, kind of extract that, that geo value and communicate that to the audience. So I'm I'm hoping to be wild a little bit as I as I pace the floors. I think we should make yeah, hashtag um... geo value shirts and just walk around with them. <laughs> there you go. So, geo value. So... No, that's that's Walmart's already got that. Right? It would be the Walmart geo value, and I don't know that we want to we want to use that. Uh, no, I'm not wearing that shirt. Uh, and, anyways, <laughs> um, it, it, my last two podcasts and and actually recently, just a lot of uh, conversations I've had uh, have been with open source intelligence people. These are people all over the world that are um, providing information from publicly available sources, mashing it together and saying, look, Twitter, here's, you know, here's a Russian tank and here's the location. And if you're Ukrainian, you can blow this up. Uh, And it's been very interesting. And, you know, I've actually learned quite a few things from the O centers that I think everyone in the GWINT space should probably think about. And um, the, one of those things, the thing that's kind of stands out for me the most is that the OSINT community is super engaged they're hyper engaged to a level that i just do not see in the geoint community a lot of that might be to the fact that a lot of the work we do is you know security clearances and things like that but they have all these discord groups and um telegram groups and every social media you can think of has have these different groups that are focused on OSINT 
Um, Reddit, for example, uh, has a good OSINT group. And when they post stuff in there, they're, they're getting rapid feedback on, hey, you know, hey, where's, we, I saw this image, where was it taken? Boom, and they get somebody will go and do the geolocation and figure out where it was taken and, and then that gets shared out um, somewhere. That's one of the things I think has the largest impact on the growth of of any int, right? Is having a good community. If you have a strong community um, that's engaged, uh, then people will be more likely to engage with each other. It's just kind of self licking ice cream cone in that in that regard. Um, how about how about OSINT as a whole? You know, what are what are your thoughts on? Um, well, we could just say OSINT. We but let's approach it from a geoint mindset. You know, um, what what can the geoint community learn from OSINTers? Or uh, what do we need to be paying attention to um, in the OSINT space right now? Because you can do both at the same time, right? You can be a geo and OSINT person because OSINT is not, OSINT is, uh, you know, you're analyzing publicly available information. Uh, a lot of that could be geospatial in nature or you get to a geospatial answer. Um, what are your thoughts on on that? I was totally hoping you were going to go over the line, and then that way I didn't have to say it. Um, <laughs> this ought to be good. Which, you were skating, which skating line? So close. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that geo is just way harder than OSINT, and anybody can do OSINT, right? Um, <laughs> so, after after the, what I've whole, what I've seen, I I can say that there are some tools that make it easy on the OSINT side, but the more complex investigations i don't think anybody could just do like if, sure, you, sure. if you go on bellingcat's website i i think it'd be very i don't think anybody could just do that type of work i yeah. think i was referring more to the collection of data yeah, or okay. the or the okay. accessibility to it right you don't need to go to nine months of school to understand how to open your eyes right and see something or or see that somebody yeah. else saw something and then be able to understand what they saw um and then use that uh to, to build some sort of you know greater large fused, fused intelligence product. But I think the reality too is the barrier to entry in that in that int it probably isn't as hard. Again, I don't wanna I don't want to discredit what happens after that, what you do with the data, the tools and, and techniques that are used to, to be the very best. So I don't wanna I, I don't want to discount it. But um assuming it seems like it's it's an easier thing to get into than the geospatial world. So I don't I don't know if it's it's fair to kind of put the two together and say there's something they did that we're not doing um, because I, I I argue that truly understanding uh, geospatial from soup to nuts is is more complex. Yeah, I mean, look, here's the great thing about OSINT: it works in both worlds, right? For the traditional intelligence person, OSINT becomes another source to corroborate what you're collecting through your other means, right? And so. I think it's a tremendous asset in that regard. But for the non sort of intelligence professional who's using OSINT as its only source, look, let's face it, we're sharing more information about ourselves than we ever have before, whether it's on social media, whether it's every credit card payment and transaction we make, whether it's, you know, the way we communicate, right? There's so much data out there. And the, there are really smart people who can who can pull the breadcrumbs, pull the threads, and pull together some really interesting stories from that. I have a, a good buddy, Paul Franz, who's uh, spent a lot of time with CSIS, and he spent a, a, a tremendous amount of time pulling together really, really interesting stories about everything from you know the locations of, of Russian missile launchers to you know cross border policy stuff to I mean just all sorts of international affairs using nothing but open sources, and when the intelligence community started to look and say, wow, how are these guys doing what they're doing? Because a lot of what they see is either before we see it or in just different ways in which we've traditionally been able to see it because we don't have the sources they have. I, 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 it's truly impressive. So to your point, I think open source is here to stay. I think it's an amazing asset that we can corroborate what we know and collect on the more traditional intelligence side. And in lack of nothing else, where we don't have traditional intelligence, I think it becomes the most important form of data we have to start making assessments uh, and reporting what we think we know. So yeah, I just see nothing but growth in the open source space. And look, let's face it, it also solves one other challenge that we've traditionally had. On the closed network, you know, in a secure environment side of the house, 
we can't communicate, we can't share, we can't talk, we can't work with our international partners very well. It's just, it's not conducive to corroboration. And I think that's where OSINT really helps is it's data we can share immediately. We can talk to our friends and allies about without fear of, of sharing or oversharing. And it becomes something that everybody can see, feel, and touch uh, in a real way. Yeah. And accepting as an authoritative source, right? That's still the really hard one. Is it authoritative or is it not? I'd argue that I know more about my neighborhood than anybody else does, right? So if somebody with other sources from far away thinks they've got a, a better handle, they don't. But it, we're getting closer, right? People are starting to accept that as an authoritative source and, and accurate, right, and timely. And so that's a big deal. Well, very, very cool. Good stuff. I could probably talk to you guys all day, but I know everyone's got a, got lives to live and all that good stuff. So I uh, appreciate you hopping on. How do people get in contact with you? We'll start there. E easiest, way, easiest way is through the website, right? Um, www.g261.com. Uh, we're always okay. floating around at some of these trade shows. Uh, we have a Twitter handle as well uh, and our LinkedIn page. They're all good ways to get a hold of us. Awesome. Well, I will place all of your links in the description. If you're on uh, one of the audio podcast app, just go through the description. You'll see the links there um, on YouTube as well. And uh, appreciate you guys hopping on. Great talking to you. Um, thanks for listening. This is the NDS show. I'm Nick. Everyone have a great day.